So uh, to introduce myself, so I may be an unfamiliar face to many of you, but I hope to have that change over the course of the academic year. I'm the new Dean of Engineering. My name is Cheryl Ehrman. I've been on the job all since July. It's been a wonderful thing to come back to California and this amazing university. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce our speaker for our Silicon Valley Leadership Symposium. So we have Willem Rollins, and he received his degree in electronic engineering from the Rijkshogere Technische School, or RHTS, in Anderlecht, Belgium, in 1965. He started his career with Hewlett Packard in Belgium in 1967. He held several jobs for HP in Belgium. In 1975, Wim moved to Grenoble, France, and he continued his career with HP. In 1983, he moved to the United States. He held several management positions, and he finished his career at HP as senior vice president in charge of HP's computer systems organization with responsibility for HP's worldwide computer systems business of about $6 billion. In 1996, Wim left HP to become CEO of Xilinx, and then later also became chairman of the board. Under Wim's leadership, the company's revenue more than tripled to just under $2 billion and increased market share in the programmable logic business from 30% to over 50%. During his tenure, Xilinx was nominated several times in the top 10 of Fortune magazine's 100 best companies to work for, so things to keep in mind, all of you looking for jobs. Wim retired as CEO of Xilinx in January 2008, but remained chairman of the board. He retired completely from the company in August of 2009. So Wim serves on several industry and charity boards. He is a board member and a member of the Compensation Committee of eSilicon, a private company, and is a board member of IMEC, a Belgian research organization. He's also on the board of several startup companies. Mr. Rollins is a board member of the El Camino Hospital Foundation, a member of the Board of Trustees of Santa Clara University, and the chairman of the Advisory Board of Engineering Pathways to Success at San Jose State University. So Wim holds an honorary doctorate from Santa Clara University in 2004, and then from the Catolica Universität Leuven, Belgium in 2009. So with all these distinguishments, let's welcome Wim to our stage. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, nice introduction. It was the best introduction that I've had since uh, this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my story, you've heard my story a little bit already, but uh, let me add a few more things. I really started uh, being interested in electronics since I was 13 years old. I started to open up radios and try to put them back together and so on. And so there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to become an electronics engineer, which I did. And uh, it really is, uh, if you do something like that, you know, I really felt that in my 50 years that I've been in business, that I've never really worked. I've done my hobby, you know. And it's one of my recommendations to you also. When you're looking for a job, do a job that you really like, that is close to your heart, and that feels like your hobby. So in these 50 years that I'm in high tech, I've made a lot of mistakes and I've learned a lot of things. And I was going to share some of these with you this, this, uh, this afternoon. This afternoon. Um, some of them are good, some of them are, are not so good, but I hope they will help you in your, in your own career future uh, going on. So first of all, and I already mentioned it, you have to do a job that you like. You have to be motivated in your job because you're going to do your job for the next 30, 40 years, maybe longer. And if you have, you're not motivated, you're not happy in your job, you cannot do a good job. And don't forget that nobody ever gets promoted for not doing a good job. You know? So it's very important to do a good job to begin with. Um, so find a job that you really like, that that your heart is in it, that you can be excited about, enthusiastic about it. And if you cannot find, if your current job doesn't give you that, find another job. There's nothing wrong with changing jobs. I've, in total, I've done 17 jobs in my career, even though I was only in, 12, in two companies. Um, changing jobs allows you to find something that you rather 
like to do better and that you want to go forward to. The second advice I might give you is that uh, be curious. Ask why. First of all, it is really the spice of life. It, gives, it keeps your job interesting. It gets you out of the routine of the everyday thing that you're doing. But it's also important that you are curious because you live in a world where innovation is absolutely critical. Innovation is the only difference, the only way that we can stay ahead as Americans against the rest of the world. If we have to compete against Asian salaries, we're going to do very badly. On the other side, if you are the innovators, innovators means that we create products that are not there, that doesn't exist before. There is no competition, there is no um, competition for a price, there is no pressure on the price, sorry, I was looking for. Uh, and uh, you can, we can maintain our standard of living. And the other thing that you, I would recommend you to do is to adopt change. Change is something that will, is continue to happen. It always happened, but it's accelerating. Change today is much faster than it was a few years ago. Thanks to the internet, information, knowledge had moved much, much quicker. And so change is important. It's fast. It's what was in today will be obsolete tomorrow. Companies that were strong today will be bankrupt in a few years. So adopt change. And there's two ways of handling change. You know, one way is to make it happen. The other way is to be happening by it. In other words, be the, the, the subject of change. Make it happen. Be the change masters. Make proposals to make things different, to move forward, to uh, come up with new ideas, new technologies. Don't be afraid to position or propose new ideas to your boss. Um, because if we make the change happening, uh, we will be uh, we'll be very happy. Now, it's difficult. As humans, we, we don't like change. We like to, to be in the same position, you know, go to work and do our job. Uh, most of the time, we don't like change. But change is good. And if you really put your mind to it, you can really adopt change and be a driver of change. And that's what I've done in my career. You know, when I, I started my career with you at Packard, I was a repair engineer for instrumentation. I repaired voltmeters and oscilloscopes and things like that. And HP came out with a computer business. I moved to the computer service. I became a computer service engineer. I discovered software. I became a software engineer, and so on and so on. So always trying to find something new Something that I said, eh, I don't know what a computer is. I don't know how computers work. But I'm talking about it in the 60s. Don't forget it, you know. Mainframes was the computer then. And they took a whole room like, like this one here. Uh, so I didn't know what they were. I didn't know what languages were. I didn't know what programming was. But I was curious. And I found it out. And it really helped me quite, quite, quite good in my career. Because I learned of the new technologies, like networking, for instance, and I became a networking specialist for Hewlett Packard. And that's one of the reasons why they moved me to the United States. So really, by being curious, by being, asking why is this working? How does this work? That's interesting. I don't know what this does, but let me figure it out. You become a change agent. You become, you change yourself, and you're ready for taking on the new job when these new technologies will come to the market. Now, when you look at your career, you look at your friends, you look at your colleagues, people tend to always reason in black and white, in good and bad. Is my, it is a good job or it is a bad job? In reality, what my experience has shown is that there is no such thing as black and white. There are shades of gray. Let me give you an example. If you're a very creative person, you'll be a hero in the first phase of a project when the creativity is important, when you come up with new ideas, when you do brainstorming, and so on and so on. You'll be a hero. But once the project advances 
and become in execution mode, it's a lot more difficult. It's, you have to execute. You cannot come up with new ideas. You cannot change things all the time. So now suddenly, the creative engineer that you were a hero in the beginning of the project, now you become a problem for, for the problem, for, for the project. Because you want to change, and people say, no, no, we've done enough change. We need to get a product out. We need to we have deadlines to meet. We have to, and so on and so on. So that's what I mean to say is that, you know, when you look in a situation, when you are in a situation, you have a friend, a colleague, a boss, think about them as that they are shades of gray. They are not good or bad. They have strengths and they have weaknesses. And it's by understanding that, understanding their strengths and weaknesses, that you can really be good friends with them, that you can understand what, why they are reacting like that. Uh, you can understand what happens uh, in their mind you know, when, uh, when they do something. Uh, you can select them, if you are a manager, to do jobs that are more tuned to their strengths and their weaknesses become irrelevant. Very, very important concept of management, you know, because when you look at somebody and say, I want this person to do a job for me, um, you better understand what his strengths and weaknesses are so you can give him a job that his strengths are beneficial and are used, but his weaknesses are not detrimental and get you in trouble, okay? So don't forget circumstances, your people you know, the situation in the world is shades of gray. There's goods and there's bad things, always. And don't forget that yourself, you're also a shade of gray. You also have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and that is very important, especially when you grow and you become more important in, in your company, you get promoted. We have this little marketing machine in ourself called ego. Let me tell you one thing, your ego is not your amigo. <laughs> you know? Your ego is this machine that tells you how good you are, how beautiful you are, how smart you are, and, that, and that you start to believe that, okay? And then you're in trouble because you are a shade of gray. There are good things in you and there are not so good things in you. Know what your strengths are, know what your weaknesses are, and don't let your marketing machine inside you convince you otherwise, okay? One other thing that I learned uh, in my career is that uh, it is amazing what you can get done if you don't care who gets the credit. It's in fact a quote from a CEO of Coca-Cola uh, a few hundred years ago. But it's true, you know, look at a company, there's politics. And politics means that people are positioning themselves, that they are going to do things because of political reasons, not because it's good for the company or because it's good for the project simply because of political reasons. If you can get, eliminate that, if you can get rid of that, you will be more happier, but also you will be able to get more done and be more effective, okay? And although when you're young, you, you want the recognition, if you do something, you want the recognition for that. Um, believe me, the recognition comes when the job is finished and people understand what your contributions have been. Not how you maneuvered yourself to be on the top of the list or something like that, okay? So don't care so much who gets the credit. Get the job done as quickly and as efficient as you can, and your, your boss and your teammates will be very, very happy with that. You will make mistakes. Projects will not work very well. You will be in trouble. Things will not go like you planned. The tendency then is to finger point. One thing I keep telling to people is say, you know, when you point your finger to somebody, don't forget that it's three fingers pointing to you. Finger pointing really doesn't help you very much. It makes enemies. The guys who are finger pointing to doesn't like you. Um, in general, when a project fails or something doesn't work, it's seldom the fault of one person. There's multiple people who have made mistakes for a project to fail. Um, so when something doesn't work, don't focus on what other people did wrong. Focus on what you did wrong. 
Let me give an example to illustrate that. You know, I was at Xilinx maybe a, f a few months, and um, we were launching a new product. It was going to be announced in, in April, and we had a whole marketing campaign set up for that. And um, a couple of weeks before the launch, the marketing VP came to see me and says, we have a problem. The product is not ready. R&D is just this delay, the major delay. It's going to be three more, four more months. What are we going to do? And I said, uh, well, where are you? What is the problem? He says, well, we hold the marketing material is done, it's printed, the dates are on there. Um, we have organized a press event where we can show the, new, show the new product and so on and so on. And now it's, we cannot do it because, because the fault of engineering. Engineering has not done their job. So I said, yeah, that seems to be pretty obvious, you know, that engineering has the problem point here. They didn't do their job. And then I asked him, I says, does it happen often that the engineering is late? He says, yeah, all the time. So see here, he had part of the mistake, part of the problem was himself. Because he knew that engineering was always late. Why did it, you know, build in some slack in the schedule and, and delay the introduction a little bit? Because it always happened that they are late. So that's what I mean by, you know, when there is a problem, look at what went wrong, what you did wrong, sorry, and focus on that. Because that's the only thing that you can change. You know, it's the, your mistakes that you can change. You cannot ch this VP of marketing cannot change the mistakes of the engineering department. He cannot change the engineering department. But he can change his mistake. And his mistake was that he should know that engineering is late and therefore they should better put some slack in the, in the timing for introducing this new product. Okay? The, the other nice thing about thinking on your side of the, pro of the problem is that it allows you to become better in your decision making. See, this uh, marketing guy had thought a little bit and said, you know, engineering is always late. What can I do to help them? Okay. What can I do to make it easier for them to be on time? Or what is the problem? Or why are they late? Is there things that we can do? Maybe it's bringing more better customers in or whatever it is, you know? Um, so you become better and you make better decisions because good decisions are made because if in the past you made bad decisions and learn from them. You learn more from bad decisions than from good decisions often, okay? Another very important uh, thing that I hope will benefit your career, is to really understand that whatever you say, you do. Do what you say you will do. You know, companies are very complex machines. They are very complex organizations, unless you're a startup, of course. And so we are all dependent on each other. And if one person delays or is not delivering what they promised, the whole project gets delayed. And people can waste a lot of time because one person is missing a schedule. So it's very, it's very important that if you give a schedule, you execute on that schedule. If you promise to do something by Monday, you do it by Monday. Or better do it by Sunday, to be, to be sure. Uh, it's the number one criteria that will get you promoted. If you execute consistently. Now, you can say, well, yeah, but sometimes there is things that you cannot do about, you know, there's outside forces that uh, make you miss your schedule. Uh, if that is the case, learn from them and make sure in the future you get these ideas in your, um, in your planning, that you think about, about it when, uh, when they happen. Um, But, uh, or make sure that you tell people ahead of time that, you know, yes, I promise you by Monday, but I'm depending on this and these and these factors. So that your boss knows that, yeah, if you're late, it's, it could be reasons that you're late, that it's not your fault. 
okay? Um, but also help out. See, because you are dependent, Common is a big, big machine, and we're all dependent on each other. So by being, by the fact that you're dependent on each other, so when, whenever you have a dependency, make sure that you follow up with that person. So you know, I'm dependent on your code that you deliver on Friday, and then I can deliver mine on Monday. <laughs> Uh, how are you doing? Are you on time? Can I help? Is there, um, is there a chance that you will be late? And so by working with them, you can mitigate the delay if there is one. And in the end, everybody will benefit. You, you will be able to keep your, your promise. The project will be done on time. The boss will be happy. You all get a promotion and stock options. No. <laughs> okay. So let me go on with the other things that I've learned here. And this is a very important one. This mainly when you get higher up in the organization, you become a manager. Um, you'll be in a situation that you have to make decisions. And typically decisions are often made with a ver very short timeline. I would recommend that you think about decisions on a longer timeline. There is something called unintended consequences. Unintended consequences, people, things that happen that people didn't think about. Because they didn't think what could happen with their decision. So when you have an important decision to make, and it could really impact, you know, your group or your company or so on and so on, take time to think about, take time to think about uh, what are the reasons why we're making a decision, what are the bad consequences of the decision, potential bad consequences of the decision, and how are we going to mitigate them? And what is the exit strategy? In other words, uh, if, um, if the decision turns out a bad decision, how can you extract yourself from it? Very, very important that you think about that be before it happens, because uh, sometimes it may uh, force you to do things differently. And let me give you an example. At Xilinx, we were in the US, or approached by another FPGA, Field Program or Gateway company, a uh, competitor of ours, to merge with us. And initially, they said, oh my God, look at that, you know, they, they, we were about seven, eight hundred million dollar company. They were about a hundred million dollar company. By merging, we would grow to about hundred million dollars. The company would be bigger. So it looks like a good deal. They're in the same market as we are, same type of products. Our products were not really competing against each other. Uh, this, this looks like a good deal, okay? Then I said, you know, okay, what if we buy this company or we merge with this company? What is going to happen with their products? Are we going to maintain both product lines? He says, well, no, some of the product lines will have to be terminated. We will have to stop some of these product lines because they're similar to what we are producing, we don't want to produce the same product in two different places. So I said, okay, what is going to happen with these customers from the products that you cancel? They're going to be pretty upset, right? You build a machine with using parts from this company, and now they get acquired by Xilinx, and the part that you use is no longer in manufacturing. Nobody had thought about that, it was a very important factor. And at the end, we decided not to, not to do the merger because we felt that the, the negative impact of the, um, the customers that we would be disappointing uh, would be so great that it was not worth doing the merger. And in fact, as far as I know, the company is still, the company is still existing today. Uh, which was in the press lately. So you see, that's what I call thinking ahead of important decisions, thinking to the negative side, thinking about, you know, if we do this, what could happen with our customers? What could happen with our partners? What could happen with um, our suppliers? Um, how would they react if we do this and we execute this plan? Can we mitigate that? What happens if it doesn't work out? You know, we merge and it doesn't work out. How can we extract ourselves from the situation? These are very, very important notions. And my, my ex experience shows that very few companies do really a good job in analyzing 
problems that their decisions can bring. And that's why you have so often unintended consequences. That's why 73% of mergers fail. 73% of mergers don't work out correctly. So it's, it shows that there is a big problem here. And the last thing that I want to talk about is something that is totally different, you know, but I found very, very useful. When something happens to you, in your mind, so, sorry, let me say it differently. If you see something happening, your mind makes up what it sees. What happens and what your mind Im imagines happens are two different things. That's why witnesses are in general not very reliable. Okay, because and multiple tests have shown that you have 10 witnesses of, of, of something, you have 10 different stories. Because you see something and your mind interprets what it sees and makes something like that. So it means that you can, in your mind, tell if you should be positive or negative, happy or unhappy. Okay? My recommendation to you is that when something happens to you, and you analyze it, cultivate, try to look at the positive side of things. Because by looking at the positive side, you'll be much happier in your life and you will make better decisions. And I'll give you other examples of that later. The mind is a very strange thing, you know. It, it, really, so it really makes up things that don't exist, that they have not seen. We'll give an example. You're going to a restaurant with your girlfriend or boyfriend. The waiter drops some soup on your new suit. Your reaction could be, one, he did it on purpose. He was, you know, unhappy with his, his job. He was unhappy with seeing me. He was unhappy with my girlfriend or whatever. Uh, he was jealous. He did it on purpose to embarrass me. That's a negative feeling. You're going to be, you're going to create negative emotions, and you're going to be not very happy with that waiter. Another way of looking at it is to say, oh, the guy, he's probably new, he stumbled, he didn't know it, he didn't do it on purpose, it's not a big deal, I can get my suit cleaned and no problem, small, small stain only, blah, blah, blah. In other words, you can turn it into more positive feelings, okay? So you have the same effect here. Way to drop soup on your suit. But your mind can make two different scenarios. And you, you decide what scenario you're going to follow. It's your mind. You can decide I'm going to be positive or I'm going to be negative. My recommendation to you is cultivate positive feelings. You know, feelings like humor, curiosity, compassion. Sympathy versus negative feelings of anger, envy, and so on. Another example I can give you, I was um, traveling for business and I arrived very late at the hotel and I guaranteed late, late arrival. So the, the hotel bill was paid ahead of time, but I'd give my room away. It was after midnight, I come there, guaranteed late arrival, no room. Very good reason to be angry, right? You paid for the room, you had guaranteed late arrival, and when you arrive, there was no room for you. You had to move to another hotel, take a taxi, go to another hotel, waste another half hour, etc., etc. Plus the morning, you know, someone was going to pick you up in your hotel that you're supposed to be, and so on and so on. So I had all the reasons to be very angry. And he said, I thought, he said, well, the poor girl behind the counter, there's nothing she can do about it. You know, she is just following the rules, the rules of the company. Um, if that's what the company says. If, you know, guaranteed arrival, after midnight, the, the guest is not there, you can give the room away. They do it. So it's not her fault. So I just said to her, well, I'm sorry, and I know you don't like this to do this yourself, but let's make the best out of it. And... You know, I went to this other hotel. The next day, I was staying in the hotel for two nights. The next night, they gave me the, the suite as a compensation for the fact that I was being so friendly with the receptionist, okay? So 
the problem is, is, is the same in both cases, you know, there's no room. But in your mind, you can force yourself to react in a certain way. And I recommend to react positively. Have positive feelings. Because when you have positive feelings, first of all, it will be a more and more positive experience. You do not sit there angry and sleepless. Secondly, uh, very often you get rewarded for your behavior in the way that you react with people that have nothing to do with the, the situation. So I'm going to stop here and uh, ask you if there's any, any questions or anything you would like to ask me. So I have questions about that if you work with someone, maybe you can feel people do not, do not like you so much. It's just feeling maybe not obviously saying that. But how do you deal with working with such people you know already such feeling have uh, existing? So how communication and work with behavior, a lot of things to learn from your experience. Yes. Thank you. It happens quite often that you have to work with people you don't like. Okay. I sometimes tell people, says, you know, if I only worked with people I liked, there would be very few people. <laughs> uh, so um, if you have to work with people you don't like, and it's a colleague, the same level as you are, do service for them. Don't, again, don't react negatively, react positively. You know, uh, bring them a cup of coffee or uh, give them a fruit or whatever it is when you come in the morning. And you will see how, how, how they will change, their attitude will change by what is happening here, why does she do that now? And that's what you need, you need this kind of a tipping point that changes his attitude and say, oh, that person is not that bad really, and they will start treating you much better, okay? But it fits very well in the last point that I made, you know, react with a positive feeling, with a positive action, and it will turn the situation around in nine cases out of 10. In the 10th case, change jobs. Experience in like, how much work experience is usually needed to start up in tech? Like if you're 22 years old, you just graduated from an engineering major, like, um, how much experience would you need to get a tech job? Is it usually like four years or more? Typically, uh, well, startup companies don't have time to train people. So when they hire people, they hire experienced people in general. Because startup is a very intense activity. People work long hours and they don't have time to train somebody else. So the more experience, the better in general, you know. But at least I would say four or five years of experience is, is probably a good idea. If a, if a startup tells you, oh, come join us from school and we will train you, I would be very skeptical because, <laughs> like, you know, startups work 16 hours per day and they don't have time to train anybody. Sorry. So if you, if you got into school this year, let's say you're young and then getting into college, how would you spend your time throughout Sorry, your if, college years? If I was in... Mm -hmm. So let's say, you know, you got into school this year, you were younger, and uh, how would you spend your college time? Well, it's difficult to give a general answer like that, but uh, I would certainly try to spend, keep a certain percentage of my time for doing, exploring things that are not on the curriculum. Read a book about history, for instance, or... Uh, read a book about some technology that you don't know. Uh, I would take some time, 5%, 10% of my time saying, I'm not going to focus on my studies or my books that I have, but I'm going to do something different. Because I think it kind of helps your mind to open up to, to your studies, you know, it gives you a break. And you never know that you come up with some nice, nice ideas. <laughs> um,
Yeah, that's probably, I would also spend time with building relationships. You know, uh, school is a good opportunity, you have plenty of opportunities, sorry, to build a relationship, you know, you go to lunch, sit next to somebody that you've never seen before and start a dialogue, start a discussion. Nine times out of 10, it will probably lead to nothing. But one time out of 10, it can be really very important. My oldest friend for 60 plus years, I met her in such a circumstance. I'd never seen him before. I said, hey, how are you doing? And he's still, uh, he's still my friend 60 years later in Belgium. So that's my two recommendations. Do something different from what you're, not, what you're focusing on. And by the way, this is true also for work. You know, it's always good, even when you have a job and you do you work on a project or something like that, to take some time out to do something different. Read a book about something or study some new technology or whatever it is. So do something different. And secondly, build relationships. Uh, you, talk, you talked about what you would do if you enter a college now. What were you doing when you were in college? Uh, <laughs> and were, were, you, were you any different from your, your, your friends, your classmates? And secondly, for you to go up to a CEO position and chairman of the board, I think I'm very curious about your life experience, but what were you like on your job? You, you, were, you kept thinking about 20 years from now, I'm going to be a CEO, or you just think about, I'm trying to get this product right. I try to get my colleagues work together uh, without thinking about long term, like 20 years from now, I want to be a CEO. That, that's sort of a short. Uh, yeah, let me answer the second question first, because it's more recent. <laughs> uh, First of all, I, I kind of divided my time in, in groups. You know, so I said that I want to spend about 25% of my time talking with customers. And it's important you do that because you get in this trend of everyday work and you forget to talk to customers. So I, I took one week per month that I would go out and visit customers. And that was my agenda, it was scheduled, the sales management knew I was coming and so on. The second thing that is very important is that you have to realize that as CEO, you can single-handedly destroy a company, but you cannot single-handedly make a company. To make a company, you need a team. And the team is, you have to cultivate it, you have to manage it. In the high-tech industry, you cannot have a hierarchical structure. High-tech industry, high-tech companies, it's really like an orchestra. You know, where you have a bunch of specialists, and then you as CEO are the orchestra leader. You don't know how to play the piano as well as a pianist can. He's a pianist, he's an expert. You can hear if he plays well or not, <laughs> but you cannot play as well as he can, or the flutist, or the violinist, or something like that. So you're in a situation that you're managing, if I can say so, a group of people that are more expert, have more expertise than you have, but you are held accountable for the results, okay? Now the way you do that is by making sure that you understand people's strengths and weaknesses. So when you give them a job, you know that can they do it, are there a chance to succeed in that job or not? But you do it also by maintaining contact, by talking to people. I was very proud, you know, I, we had a, a little party at Xilinx and a new employee came to me, or I saw a new employee, in fact, and I went to him and said, hi, I know you're new, and, and how are you doing, and do you like it here, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, it's amazing, he says, I worked eight years in another company, and I've never seen the CEO. And I'm two weeks at Xilinx, and I've seen you two times already. Okay, people want to, especially in high tech, it's very egalitarian culture. I know that I cannot design a chip like that. my designers can. There's no way I can do that. 
So what you need to do is really make sure that you stay in touch with them. You make sure they understand where you want to go, what you're doing, how you're evolving, and so on and so on. Very, very important. Don't tell them how to do their job. Tell them what the objectives are and let them have the freedom to, to get their job done. So that's your answer about CEOs. Uh, unfortunately, most CEOs don't do that this way. They stay in their ivory tower. To avoid that, one of the tricks that I use is that every year I move my office to another part of the campus. Because it's proven that you communicate mainly about 100 feet around your office. You know? So by moving to different parts in the campus, I was in different parts of the organization. Sometimes my office was in production engineering. You know, sometimes my office was in software design. Some of my office was in marketing. Uh, one year my office was in chip design. You start to know these people because they're sitting next to you. You start to understand what drives them, what motivates them, what their problems are. Very often when they have a, mis when they have a serious issue that their boss doesn't resolve, they come to you because you're familiar to them. Okay? They will tell you, you know, that project is, is really in trouble. Is it not important for a CEO to know that? <laughs> but how otherwise would you know that? Unless you mix with the, with the people in the, in the organization. When I went to, I had to go somewhere, I never went, I never followed the aisles. I just went through the cubes. Because it, it showed my presence, you know. And you develop kind of a sixth sense that after a while, you know, just by looking at somebody, you can sense that something is wrong. So we then stop and say, hey, how are you doing, Joe? And poof, there it came out, you know, what the pro his problem. Because it was, you can see it on his face that he had a problem. Okay? When I was at school, you know, like I said, I did electronics when I was 13 years old, and that's what I did. We were part of a club of other people who, who did the same thing, and we, we did all kinds of made all kinds of stuff, electronics, amplifiers, transmitters, things like that. Some of them illegal, uh, but it was fun. Another question. So just to follow up on what you just said, why don't you share with us um, in your high school, senior year, how you um, sadly weren't making good grades. But yes. your passion was still engineering in some fashion. So why don't you t share the story on how it was that you went from high school to college to study engineering and... Yeah, well... Like, this is my wife, my wife Maria, by the way. Um, she knows more. She, she knows all my secrets, all my bad sides, <laughs> my mistakes. <laughs> yes, I, like she said, you know, I didn't have very good grades in high school because I was too occupied by, by my hobby, which was electronics, okay? And so I, I really didn't study very much, and I got passing grades. And so in Belgium, at uh, age 15, they test you. Uh, they kind of psychological test to see if, and they advise you what your career could be. And so I'd written on the form, I said, I want to be an engineer. And the psychologist who tested me and looks at me, and looks at this form and says, you want to be an engineer? I said, oh no, you cannot be an engineer. You're not smart enough to be an engineer. Your results are not good enough. He says, what is your second choice? He says, my second choice is to be a chef. Okay. He says, yeah, that, that's probably better suited for you. <laughs> uh, I'm still cooking as a hobby, you know. But uh, fortunately, I didn't follow his advice. I became an engineer. And the reason was very simple. In high school, I was bored. I had to study all this stuff. I had no, no idea what, why I was doing that. Plus, I was too busy doing, playing electronic games and things like that, <laughs> uh, to, to really uh, pay much attention to school. But then when, when I got to engineering school, I got more and more interested because that was interesting stuff, you know, stuff that I wanted to learn about. And so my grades improved and improved and improved, and I came out as number one in the class. 
uh, for somebody who was not smart enough to be an engineer. I felt pretty proud. Other questions? For someone who has been so involved in high tech, such as yourself, obviously you have encountered multiple obstacles throughout your career, and I'm pretty sure you'll still, you're still going to be facing some. As for all of us, I'm pretty sure we have encountered obstacles, or will encounter new ones, or are currently facing them. What advice have you not mentioned in your slides that you can give to us right now? Oh, this. There's a few things. Uh, probably the um, oh. yeah. One 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 other piece of advice that I could have given you. Uh, which, if something is too good to be true, it probably is, you know. You hear it often that people come to you, sell you something, or try to convince you about something, and if it sounds it's too good to be true, be very careful. Uh, we have, people have lost fortune by believing things that are not possible, or in the long term. Um, I didn't get the first part of your question, could you repeat it? Oh yes, yes, yes. You you will you will encounter obstacles. You will encounter failures. You will encounter make mistakes. That will happen all the time. Uh, what I would say is, when you make a mistake, admit it as quickly as possible, and don't persist in hiding it or camouflaging it or finger pointing it. Uh, the best thing is just to be open about it. Say, hey, I made a mistake. In fact, I have several times in my career I stand in front of a group like this, my employees, that I said, you know, remember I promised you this and this and this, but I'm sorry, I was wrong. There is, uh, some people have a hard time saying that they do something wrong, but the engineers know. They know that that project didn't work very well, or that decision was not a very good decision, or it was a good decision at the time, but circumstances have changed it, uh, they know. And so by trying to hide it or pretend that it was not a mistake, you just lose credibility. And for a manager, credibility is the most important thing in life. Because what you're asking as a manager, you're asking people to follow you. Say, so, you know, I have this idea, follow me and we'll make this idea happen. If you have credibility, they will believe you, and they will follow you, and they will give 100% of their work to make your idea happen. If you don't have credibility, if you don't believe you, they don't trust you, it's just not a slogan. And that's what happens so often in companies. You know, they come up with slogans that are hang on the wall for a few years or a few months, but nobody pays attention to them. One last question. Last question. Um, one thing I've uh, noticed while um, I think it's really common amongst like uh, group works is that there's some situations where like um, where two people or like a group of people are working on a project and there's some situations where you know like a, like a part of the group or you know the other person if you're working with one other person is not doing essentially much of the work well where it's leaving you um, what uh, would be like a good advice to do in that situation Yes, unfortunately, that is often the case, you know. Uh, and in a company, I would say if you are, you're part of a company, go to your boss and explain it to him. To me, it's one of the failures of management. Management should not allow employees not to do their job. If they don't do their job, they should either correct them or replace them. So if you are in a, in a team, 
go to your manager and say, I don't know if you know that, but Joe there, he doesn't do his job. He's always late, he does this, that, whatever it is. And let him take care of it. And if he doesn't take care of it, he's not a good manager. Because this is, a, like I said, one of the most important uh, problems that exist in companies. Especially large companies, you know, where you have large teams, 10 people, one person doesn't do his job. It means that the other nine have to work harder to compensate for the one that is not doing their job. And by the way, they know it. And I can tell you often, management does not know it. I've been manager a long time, so I, I know. Because these guys are very good in camouflaging that they're not doing anything. You know, they, they're always very busy when you're in the room and things like that. Uh, so tell your boss, say, you know, this has not happened and do something about it. If it's a small informal group, you know, that you're just two or three people in a project, I would sit down with a person and say, you know, is there something wrong? You know, do you like the job or because it seems that you don't, you're not, your heart is not in it. You're not fully committed to it. Uh, and that happens, you know, people take a job that they think they like it, but they don't like it. Huh? And then they don't do a very good job in it. So um, just sit down with a person and have a frank discussion, but be, be diplomatic. There's a good book that exists that I can uh, uh, recommend to all of you. It's called Difficult Conversations. It's a, a book about how to handle these difficult conversations that you have with your spouse, with your children, <laughs> and with your boss. You know? <laughs> And something doesn't work out, how do you deal with it? How do you sell it without be becoming defensive? Because if you, if you go to him and say, you're not doing a good job, <laughs> his defenses go up and nothing is, he's not going to listen to the rest anymore. So that's the problem that you have on, on communicating that kind of a message. Okay? Difficult conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you.